I don't know what it was. He's walking upright like a man. Sightings in and around Vermont. Bigfoot sightings across New England have been reported. Red glowing eyes, about seven feet tall. Red eyes, big old fang claws coming out through. Three inches long, you know, just sharp as they could be. There has been another UFO sighting flying over the Royal Botanic Gardens. There are 500 UFO sightings in the world every month. The truth is out there. So, uh, fun story. Yes. I was going to paint my Battletech mounts. Okay, gotcha. Um, Are these the printed or the purchased ones, or both? Both. Okay. I was starting gotcha, with the gotcha, purchased gotcha. ones because purchased ones, the, the resin minis are easier to paint mm-hmm. than the uh, 3D printed ones. Uh, just because there's less there's less capillary action that happens. Yeah. Right? And, you know, you have to do multiple prime coats on 3D printed minis and you have yeah. to get uh, filler primer. And I don't have filler primer on hand right now. Mm-hmm. So I, I still have to go to, like, Lowe's and pick up some filler primer. But that's another thing. So I go to – I use a wet palette, right? Yes. Um, because I like it because it lets you do gradients really easily because mm-hmm. you just place – you place a drop of paint on one side and then place another drop like a couple inches away, and then you blend them together and you get a gradient. Yeah. Just naturally from the, the way that the process works because there's a lot of liquid. Yeah. So I open up my wet palette that I hadn't opened in a month. Uh-huh. And it was covered in mildew. Oh, Yeah. So I was just like, well, I'm just going to get rid of this palette because the, the sponge was already bad on it. Yeah, yeah. And all that good stuff. So I was just like, all right, I'm just going to get a new palette. So mm. that killed my momentum. <laughs> <laughs> so I haven't painted any uh, Battletech minis yet. Oh. <laughs> Even though I got a new palette. So, you know, eh, it's life. Yeah. The um, I have been printing up a storm, though. Because I finally fixed. I noticed. I saw yes. your post on Instagram of the uh, the, the train. And I looked at it. And it's like, He's been busy. <laughs> yes. That's, that's – that's, I don't know how many people looking at it would go, that's a lot of time. But that was a lot of time. That yeah, thing's been I, running. I've, I've basically had my 3D printer running 24-7 for the past week. Yeah. Um, I almost have a full board. Damn. Right on. Yeah. It, it took a lot to dial it in, though, because, yeah. you know, it, it's it's hexagons and they're supposed to be interlocking. Mm-hmm. So it took a little bit of time to get the um, – I had to find the right Z setting to get the, the pieces to stick well enough to the board. Gotcha. So then that way they maintained that uh, that proper hexagonal stuff. And yeah. I also played with multiple layer heights. I found point two to be the best layer height for that. Nice. Do you do anything to improve adhesion to the platform? Or do you just turn uh, right onto it? So what I did, what I did was, uh, I played with temperature settings of okay. the because I have a heated PEI bed. Yeah. So I played with temperature settings, and I, um, I also played with the Z, the Z height to determine how li- low the first layer was. Mm-hmm. So if I squash it in a lot, a lot more than I really should, I get better adhesion uh, for the first layer. Okay. And I've just been basically printing the same shape so many times that there's yeah. actually a, a discoloration in the PEI sheet now, <laughs> which is pretty great. Um, but yeah, no, I eventually I'll actually play Battletech. <laughs> uh, I found but, that uh, pre-print, you have to have something on the bed, like a sheet of something. It sounds like you're using PEI sheet or if you're using a sheet yeah. of Kapton film or what have you. But just before... Um, the nozzle hits the right temperature and the print starts. If you hit it with a light spray of, I found the purple Aussie hairspray works best. Oh, really? Um, and then it, start printing it. It helps it stick to the platform a little bit better. Um, I I actually don't really have adhesion problems, yeah. to be totally honest. Okay. I uh, if the part's big, I'll get a little lift, but it's yeah. not like, but that that's just that's not an abnormal thing. When a when a piece is so big, it just kind of yeah. curls a little. Does you're using PLA, right? Yeah. Does your um, extruder head have like a little fan that shoots air yep. down onto? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got that running at max value. Okay. So. 
Yeah, I I found that tweaking the speed there's a there's like a there's like a Goldilocks area for speed yeah. tweaking because on my printer you can speed it up to like 125 or you yeah. know 130. I don't like to go above 130 because then it gets it starts to get too fast. You start mm -hmm. to get, lose quality. Yeah. But I find 125 to be the sweet spot. Okay, right on. It's but, all about them feeds and speeds, man. Yeah. So. This is completely unlistenable to anyone who's not interested in three D printers. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, I I don't know. It's fun. I, I you know what I really want to do what? is I want to get a little bit better at like CAD and three DS Max and stuff like that. Yeah, I'm not sure which, but um, I want to start working on. Uh, converting like, like I want to rip the 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 models from mm -hmm. the PlayStation Beast Wars game, oh, and then start working on uh, Beast Wars PlayStation versions, so I can like yeah. you know actually play around with it a little bit and make mm -hmm. like miniature uh, Maximals and Decept and Predacons. Yeah, that'd be cool. That might be non-trivial. Oh no! It's here's the thing. I know it's not true. Okay, what I probably those, do those models are in the game. They yeah. tend to be surface bodies, and when you yep. print, you can't have just surfaces. So yeah, you have yeah. to like stitch all the different faces together and like fill everything in. And yeah, yeah. No, I'm aware. <laughs> okay. Somebody was asking me for three D printing advice for how to rip. 3D models from games, and I was like, yeah. it's not easy. <laughs> and they're like, yeah. thanks. And I'm like, have fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we had a short one last week. I thought you were going to have a short one this week. You past tense. Thought. So I, I think I remember sending you a text message about. Yeah. yeah. So I hadn't come up with a cryptid until yesterday. Uh -huh. At the time of recording. No shit. No shit. So I was like, well, let's do an easy one. Oh, God. I'm looking for the text. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, you said something like the story wrote itself. Yes. Because I was going to do something different. Uh -oh. And then I started working on the story. Yeah. Let's get into uh, you guessing what I did it on. So. Okay. The first sighting was uh -huh. sometime in the, uh, let's say, let me just, uh, 1700s roughly. The first okay. recorded sighting. Um, its taxonomy is snake. And its region is North America. What cryptid did I pick this week? Uh, oh yeah, we're also also we're Cryptopedia. Oh yeah, yeah, thing. we're Cryptopedia. We do a podcast about monsters and shit. Uh, <laughs> what the hell? Seventeen hundreds. Yep, that was the first sighting of it. it can, can I get like just super general region, north, south, east, west America? Uh, I'm I'm thinking. I'd say southwest. eastern to the southeast. Southeast. It, it it's southern. It, there's a lot of them. There's a lot of sightings of it southern, and there's a lot less sightings of it now. Okay, so I I can't think. So here here is my train of thought. I'm thinking early America south. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking Spanish troops. Okay. So that that's where my head's at right now. So I'm your thinking... your head's in the wrong direction. No shit. Okay. Well then I'll stop thinking that way. A giant fucking snake. A giant snake. Um, I didn't say giant. Oh, not giant. Oh, but wait a minute. an interesting snake. Wait a fucking minute. Wait yeah. a minute. You yeah. dirty son of a bitch. You yeah. dirty son of a bitch. It's a hoop yep. snake. It's a hoop snake. It's a hoop snake. We're doing hoop snakes. Oh, man. I'm excited for this one. I, so I'm, the... I'm pretty excited. Here's the fun thing. I yeah. was originally going to have this be a grab bag of fearsome critters. Yeah. And the hoop snake was the first thing I chose. Yeah? I started going down the hoop snake uh, rabbit hole. Uh-huh. There's more to the hoop snake than I expected. <laughs> Holy 
holy shit that's amazing that's pretty so, awesome uh copy's in the in the broadcast support nice so yeah we're doing the hoop steak this week sweet uh so i'm going to let, let's let's just lead in with a uh a quote from fearsome critters uh it's the uh the dedication of the 1939 edition okay <laughs> hydrating to those who huh is it hydrating hydrating to those who have held the bag on a sniper who have jumped sideways at the call of the tree scoop who have studied the trail of the side hill sid hill side hill side hill mm-hmm. gouger and who perhaps have ringside seats at a badger fight this little collection sympathetically dedicated so that's the dedication. I'm uh, excited. I also want you to do more critters because I've never heard of a tree squeak. Yeah. Oh, there's like 40, 50 of these. Oh, so I pretty nice. much have a year's worth of episodes just on fearsome critters. That's if they're fantastic. All, if they're all half as interesting as the hoop snake, I probably yeah. have a year's worth of episodes. <laughs> that's nice. So... Uh, the fearsome critters are, for those who don't know, are an associate assortment of tall tales and local legends. Canonically, they were collected in a 1939 book by Henry H. Tyron, uh, Tryon, Fearsome Critters. There's also another book that came out later, but for the sake of this particular episode, uh, the Hoop Snake makes its first, in my opinion, canonical appearance in that book. Mm-hmm. So, and it doesn't appear in the second book. Um, the majority of these so-called critters originated yeah. as lumberjack stories. Nice. Yeah. So uh, this is a little little excerpt by Henry H. Tyron about like why mm-hmm. he recorded these stories. It occurred to me then that these tales originating chiefly in the logging camps and on the drives were a definite bit... Uh, that's a weird use of the word definite. A definite bit of American folklore and an integral part of the history of American logging and lumbering and well worth recording. So he's basically a um, cultural anthropologist for all intents and purposes. Yeah. Folk, he's a folklorist. Mm-hmm. Um, so, That's pretty cool. I like that it's like American lumberjacking folklore because that's something that you don't immediately think – where is a nice piece of folklore going to originate from early America? You don't immediately go to Lumberjack. Well, I mean, like, the uh, Paul Bunyan stories originated with Lumberjacks. True. Right? Oh, that's true. Um, and then you've got the, what's his name? Uh, Honey Dipper Dan. Honey Dipper Dan? That's a Paul Bunyan joke from um, uh, Mad TV. Oh. <laughs> God. <laughs> just remembered that he's honey dipper dan <laughs> oh it's Will there's Sasso. like a there's like a whole like segment on honey dipper dan <laughs> oh yeah one sec i'm trying to remember <laughs> oh god oh man it's so much it's so good. It's it was pretty good. I it's I got a so solid good. joke out of that. Oh, that was such a good. <laughs> Mad TV was one of those shows that when it was great, it was phenomenal. They tried to reboot it. Did they really? It didn't go over well. Well, if you don't have Will Sasso and the guy who played um, Bobby Lee, Bobby Lee, and then uh, Stewart. What's oh, um, it, uh, Michael, I forget his last name. Yeah. yeah. You need those three for it to be watchable. Yeah. They, they they carried that show. But regardless, and actually kind of related, mm-hmm. uh, the stories themselves, like these tall tales, are basically improv. Oh, nice. Because, and they act as like an ancestor to modern fiction tales, because what yeah. usually would happen, it would be a, like, a stereotypical yes and between two Mm -hmm. people where two people are in the know yeah and they keep like building a story off each other oh yeah and there's one dude who's like a greenhorn who knows nothing about it yeah it's like the snipe hunt it's literally the snipe hunt because the snipe is literally a fearsome critter oh nice 
So it's basically hazing rituals. Yeah. <laughs> um. So for the most part, these stories were crafted initially to explain a noise or an event, mm -hmm. right? Sometimes it would be to save pace, like you got you got the shit scared out of you in the woods. Yeah. Right. Um, other times, it would have tried to explain a recurring phenomenon. There's one fearsome critter that I remember finding uh, that's called the hide behind. Mm -hmm. And that basically explains why loggers would sometimes not, sometimes not come back from the woods. Because there's this monster that hides behind trees every time mm -hmm. you walk through the forest. And if you look at it, it disappears, but it will still it'll catch you eventually. Yeah. Um, but regardless of the nature of the original telling, the act of retelling the story is where the life came into the story. Mm -hmm. Right? Because yeah. it started out as the, this kernel of something, and then it slowly evolved into something greater than mm -hmm. what it originally was. Right? So the fur bearing trout originally was, you know, just a sick trout, but then yeah. eventually it became a whole other thing. And like, uh, what is it? Like, it's like taxidermy pastiche or whatever mm -hmm. the heck it's called. You know what I'm talking oh, about. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 The, so, uh, like, the jackalope is a similar thing where you. Yeah. you you uh gaffing i think is that the yeah yeah like of? a horror yeah. show gaff um yeah. like the different fairies in the mermaids the the fiji mermaid is a famous one um you get a lot of like snake boy and whatever girl and all of that and they're they're just things um that were made to be cool because they are cool i really like the the uh side yeah. show gaffs and all that they're pretty pretty dope yeah and yeah. they represent like it's like a weird form of creativity right yeah because yeah, it's yeah. a grift but at the same time like it's one of those grifts that i appreciate the artistry that went into the grift mm -hmm. totally yeah um most tall tales that are currently told to scout troops and young cancer campers <laughs> <sighs> apparently i have i had to put a disclaimer that i'm going to be mispronouncing everything too yeah <laughs> uh, can trace their origin to these assortment of critters whether it be the elusive snipe or the malicious hide behind. Uh -huh. This week, we're going to inform you, the listener, of the fearsome critters stalking the woods for unsuspecting outdoors people. Read, not me. <laughs> I am in no way at risk for being harmed by any of these creatures. So, originally, it was going to be multiple fearsome critters, as I said at the top of the yeah. episode. But it turns out, the hoop snake's snake, pretty dope has a lot it has some legs yeah despite being a snake <laughs> i get your joke damn it mm -hmm. there we go so i'm gonna read you the excerpt from uh the fearsome critters book okay that's a pretty dope picture it's got there too yeah that's actually like the original woodcut of the oh uh, is it yeah yeah that's that's I found this on a there's like an HTML version of the book that's available. Yeah. The book itself was published in 1939, so I don't think it's technically in the public domain. But, um, yeah, that's not public domain. I don't think. I don't know. Public domain's all screwy. But yeah. <laughs> uh, whoever owns the rights to the book posted it online. So. Cool. So, uh, Henry H. Tyron. Yeah. Tryon. He uh he would give the fearsome critters like <laughs> fake names like Ryan fake scientific Lannister? names. No, he's not a Lannister. <laughs> uh, so this is the fake name that he gave it. Okay. Which is not, as far as I can tell, is nothing. Mm -hmm. I think it's more of a uh, of a joke name than yeah. a real name. <laughs> Jeez, I'm dying. So it was Serpent Circulus caught a venifer. <laughs> I love it. It's I a great. It. It's a great yeah. name. That's so, so good. A well-known menace. Its existence throughout thoroughly is a well-known menace. Its existence is thoroughly established by numerous reports from highly credible parties. The characteristics appear to be about the same in all regions. Its habit of tucking its tail in its mouth and rolling at incredible speed in pursuit of its prey or fancied enemy is not duplicated, fortunately, by any other member of the animal kingdom. 
which was spelt N and I. So I think this yeah. was a uh, like I think it was scanned. Oh, I gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the tail ends in a stinger carrying venom of such power that a dose of but point oh oh three parts per million is sufficient to make even the leather skinned hodag turn green and swell up and die inside of an hour. That's pretty powerful. That's real wow. powerful. No wonder that folks wise in the woods lore are wary of this circular engine of destruction. <laughs> oh, that's, this guy's pretty good. <laughs> oh, it's it's phenomenal. The, the writing of all the fierce and wow. is wonderful. Yeah, it's like he welcome may travel. to Thunderdome. It basically, yeah. Yeah. basically, uh, he may travel on just one cylinder, but that's mm-hmm. all he needs. <laughs> The speed reached in rolling is nothing short of remarkable. A full-grown jackrabbit is pie for this sneak. <laughs> you want to try that again? A full-grown jackrabbit is pie for this sneak. <laughs> I like a full-grown rackjabbit. <laughs> a rackjabbit. Well, that's the next cryptid. Uh, it's an inverted. Dra- it's an inverted rabbit. Oh, I don't know gross. what that. I don't know what that would be, but it's nightmare. It just runs around in pain. Everything hurts. Why? <laughs> uh, a mature snake, when hooped, has a diameter of one point five nine two three feet. Okay. Uh, he has he has been clocked after being enticed to on a clearly clever. Uh, he has been clocked after being enticed onto a cleverly designed rolling meter platform at an RPM of about 1056, or a straightaway speed of some 60 miles per hour. Oh, wow. The only way to outrun him is to climb over a fence. The snake must unhoop to get through. <laughs> That's pretty amazing. There's still That's more. I'm not done. pretty awesome. The... It, 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 Oh, it goes on though. Okay. There are many authentic cases of death from this reptile's venom. Possibly the most convincing bit of data is that in a fit of pique, a hoop snake stung one of Paul Bunyan's PV handles. Of course, this handle was a sizable stick to start with, but the venom swelled to such a dimension that Paul cut it up into 946 cords of wood. And then the dang stuff wouldn't burn. It just lay in the stove and what i like that he's tying together all these <clears throat> all these different pieces of american folklore he's bringing in paul bunyan he's bringing in the hodag he's doing all of this other stuff and he's also throwing in the uh you, you know 60 miles per hour and uh it's diameter of 1.5923 feet also why nobody you don't there's no reason to measure something organic up to the fourth decimal point. Yeah, that's five sig figs. Yeah. It's a little it's a little intense. So yeah. kind of going off that, I would feel very guilty if I did a really in-depth analysis of this story as a hoax. Yeah. Because it's got extremely pre- precise measurements of venom, the diameter of the snake hooped. Uh it has Paul Bunyan. It has a speed of 60 miles per hour. It's a fast snake. It's like a, it's a freaking cheetah. <laughs> right? Like, it's clearly a tall tale. There's yeah. there's no way around it. At least this version of the story is guaranteed to be a tall tale. Yeah. And not to mention, this this means of rolling locomotion is only shared by uh, the Sukino yokai in the Mongolian desert. <laughs> so yeah. yeah uh basically in my mind the hoop snake is taking the childhood game of like hoop rolling yeah mixing it with the very real threat of venom and venom mistakes mm-hmm. and the 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 story is being told in areas of the united states where there are venomous snakes so yeah it might be just like a fun take on something for people or something along those lines. Um, yeah. It, it, it's an embellishment, right? It's mm-hmm. a it's a warning, hey, be careful, snakes are venomous. And then yeah. you make them even more scary by have them, having them go 60 miles per hour and mm-hmm. able to bite wood and make it swell up. Yeah. So, 
I was going to originally leave it here. Okay. Story. But I thought, let's look into this legend a little bit. <laughs> uh, I'm going to say this from the perspective of I think that the hoop snake is a tall tale. Uh huh. I'm no. not trying to. I'm no. not trying to. Yeah, I know. It's shocking, right? I'm not trying to reduce the value of the tall tale. I think as a tall tale, it's great. Mm -hmm. I love it. I think it's fun. Right? Like, yeah. imagine a hoop snake coming at you. That'd be nightmarish. Oh, yeah. Uh, you could you, you could uh, close pin a ball card to it so it sounds like a motorcycle. <laughs> <laughs> well, but it doesn't have an axle. We'll give it one. We'll give it one. So Imagine how, how fast a bicycle could go if you restrained two hoop snakes and got them to work in concert. Oh boy! I mean, it would go sixty miles an hour. Yeah, they're not. It's not going to exceed the maximum speed of either hoop snake. No. If anything, it will be slightly slower. Yeah. Well, they've got to carry my my weight on it. Well, yeah, that's poor hoop snakes. Poor poor hoop snakes. <laughs> Just putting a human on it in general. It's a snake. It can't support that. Yeah. Well, all snakes are demons, so. That's true. That's true. That's what the Bible says. <laughs> it does. Um, so I did some research, and I okay. found a really – I actually found a really good article. Uh, it was in Natural History Magazine. Mm -hmm. I think it was dated 1925. Um, okay. This dude basically found a bunch of historical references. He was – um, I, I go over who he is in a little bit, but he found a bunch of historical references mm -hmm. to this story. Oh, nice. Uh. And I was astonished because there's an actual chronology and evolution of the hoop sneak itself. No shit. Okay. That's pretty yeah. dope. Uh, so, the earliest occurrence I could find of a description of the venomous hoop snake was mm -hmm. dated 1688 and written by John Clayton in a letter to the Royal Society of London. Okay. The horn snake is, as they say, another sort of deadly snake. I never saw any of them unless once, shortly after my arri arrival in that country, which I cannot attest to being the horn snake, for I could not distinctly view it being in a thicket of sumac. There's This is a very long run-on sentence, by the yeah. way, because apparently uh, in the 1600s, uh, people liked run-on sentences. It's all commons, colons, and semicolons. Yeah, um, yeah. It was perched up about two feet high in a sumac branch. Its tail twisted around the shrub. In about a quarter yard stood bolt forward, leaning over the forked branch thereof. I could not see the horn with which it strikes, and if it wounds, is as deadly as the rattlesnake's bite. I like that there's an E at the end of horn. I just like unnecessary E's. It's funny because every other occurrence of horn uh, doesn't have the E. It's just that one. Huh. Yeah. The gentleman that was with me told me that it was the horn snake. But being in haste, hast, which I assume is haste, yeah. I like how they, they, they put the E on some of them and then take the E away from other <laughs> words. Uh, There's a li they have a set number of E's that they can use, so listen, they've got to move them around. We gotta, we, we've got a limited number of E's, okay? You can only use 10 E's per sentence. It's the most expensive letter. Well, yeah, well, that kind of makes sense considering it's in so many words. Yeah. Oh, yeah. If you're doing crypto, if you're doing a uh, trying to attempt to create a cipher for cryptography, you look for E's, I's, and O's. I think first. Okay. With e being the most prevalent, because it's actually the most used letter in the English language. Yeah. So if it's a straight uh, replacement cipher, mm -hmm. it's the best way to figure it out. You'd be good at Hunt a Killer, because there's a lot of ciphers in there. Oh, I'm terrible at ciphers. Okay. <laughs> I So here's the thing. like uh -huh. I know a lot about code and code breaking. Yeah. I'm terrible at application of it. I So <laughs> I actively uh, – every time I see an escape room, there's a part of me that's like, that might be fun. And then I think about it, and I'm like, no, I just get really mad because yeah. it's one of those situations where uh, – people create these mysteries yeah 
and the solutions are what makes sense to them. Yeah. And I hate that. <laughs> you should just show up to an escape room with a set of lockpicks. <laughs> uh, I I uh I don't know if I told you the story, but I locked I got myself locked out of my office recently. Yeah. And um turns out I know how to uh break into most doors that don't have a deadbolt. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all you need, literally, is a uh, credit card. Yep. Yeah. Uh, anywho. <laughs> we're not going to go into how I broke into it. Yeah. Well, I keep a set of lockpicks in the car. Do you really? Uh, be careful with that, because you can get in trouble for keeping a set of lockpicks in your car. You can have them for personal use for if you get locked yeah. out of your house or, or garage or whatever. Yeah. You know, don't let them know you have them. <laughs> uh, let's see. So, but being in Hast. Okay, here we go. And on horseback, in the snake, in the thicket, I could not see the horn, but I had thought I should ever see, I should never have seen more of them. I should have taken a little pains to have been better satisfied. This, I think, may not improperly be referred to the dark snake. Um, it's a As little bit. It, a, it's sixteen. It's sixteen hundreds English, so it's a little bit yeah. hard to parse. Uh, but the long and short of it is, he saw a snake that he thinks was something called the horn snake. Yeah. Which, based on his description, is a super venomous snake. Because yeah. keep in mind, the rattlesnake is like super venomous, especially oh, in this yeah. time. Because I think anti venom didn't get created until the eighteen hundreds. Like, mm -hmm. late 1800s. I'll buy it. So, you're pretty much dead if you get bit by a rattlesnake. Yeah. Um, the, uh, if you want to go down a uh, uh, YouTube hole later, check out The Lock Picking Lawyer on YouTube. He's pretty great. He, he picks, like, every lock imaginable under, like, five... Like, he tries to find the hardest ones, and he gets them all done under, like, five minutes. And people send him, like custom built locks that they they uh like they machine stuff custom and like put little traps and stuff in them mm -hmm. so so that like if you do something wrong you're you're screwed and uh, uh it, it, it's pretty great that's pretty awesome i'll have to check yeah. it out then i'd also be interested in seeing um anti-venom how quickly that um they came up with the different varietals of that because I just learned that um, in vaccines, mm -hmm. after we got the rubella vaccine, the first one, mm -hmm. it was 80 years until we came up with a second vaccine. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, I did do some research into anti-venom for this episode. Yeah. Um, I don't have it in the copy because I didn't think it was useful, but since we were talking about it, uh, the way that it works is you denature a snake's venom a little bit, mm -hmm. and then you put it into a horse, cow, or sheep, and then okay. you harvest the plasma from that because that has the antibodies to deal with it. Gotcha. And then you use that as the antivenom. Oh, so I didn't it's know one that. of those it's pretty interesting. It's one of those weird things where the way because because venom is different than uh, viruses because yeah. venom doesn't really change. Yeah. Right? So we don't really need uh, – once we have a process, mm -hmm. we don't really need to redefine it as much as we do for, like, the influenza vaccine, for example. Yeah. And uh, antivenom works in a different way because uh, you're literally – it's literally antibodies that are getting pushed into you. Yeah. It's not uh, – it's not like a antiviral where it's training your immune system. You're yeah. literally augmenting the immune system. So it's 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 subtly different. Okay. But um I might have also gotten all that wrong because that was off the top of my head based on an mm. article I read last night. So <laughs> um but the key to the key to antivenom is you have to get it there's a there's a set window that you have. Yeah. Because once you once systems are damaged by venom, the anti venom won't help you. Got gotcha. like so if you if you stop breathing because you of can't venom, undo anything. You, you can can't just undo it. Something you that can hasn't just, happened already. Correct.
correct. Gotcha. That's the way it works. So that's why if you get bitten by a snake, you generally want to tie a tourniquet. Gotcha. Okay, yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, because yeah. if so, like if you get if you get bit on the hand, you want to tie a tourniquet on your arm. Yeah. But plain and simple. And if you don't know how to tie a tourniquet, I actually super recommend learning how to tie a tourniquet to everyone. Mm -hmm. It's super useful. There's no <laughs> joke in that. There's no I I'm just I'm just legitimately saying learn yeah. how to tie a tourniquet. Uh-huh. Uh because you might save someone's life. Yeah, they do it different now. Do they? Cuz yeah, the, I forget the, way... the exact example, but the um there's just a YouTube video where they had EMTs on and they're showing you how to address different like burns and cuts and and, and punctures and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And um they they it's slightly different than the way I ha had learned when I was younger, maybe like 10 years ago or mm -hmm. something like that. Um, so the way that I learned it was you take a stick, right? You, you wrap someone's arm, then you place the, you wrap the, the a piece of cloth around a stick and then you just yeah. twist as hard as you can. And then yeah. you tie a second, uh, you tie a second, piece of fabric around the uh the stick and immobilize the stick and that's how you tie a tourniquet properly yeah i would have to uh re-watch that video because i don't remember exactly how it's different but that's basically like an okay impromptu yeah. tourniquet but if you have one done by an emt it's, it's different it's different yeah i forget okay. exactly how but i think that way um causes potential damage uh, well, yeah, that's that's the uh, so. I I learned I used to. This is a fact about me that not many people know. Uh, I used to participate in Boy Scout first aid competitions. Yeah. So that was the methodology that they taught us for the competition. Yeah. Like, but then again, I also did that back in like 2007. So. My my knowledge of first aid might change, might be out of date because those things do change. So, yeah, like even the, like the Heimlich and all that, like they don't do that anymore. They have a different oh, really? thing that they do, and there's yeah, like they just don't do it. They they have a different method, and they have um, what else has changed? The whole like mouth to mouth thing. Uh, yeah. CPR CPR is different now. Um, I, I think if I remember correctly, you don't do rescue breathing in CPR anymore. Yeah. 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 Because the compression is more important than the the air into the airway. Anywho, we we've gotten off topic, but legitimately, everyone benefits from knowing a little CPR, a little little first aid. Yeah, like that's a fact. This story is referring to a horn snake, and now you may say, John, that's not a hoop snake. That's a horn snake. That's a horn snake. However, yes, turns out. This is the, like, protoform of the hoop ah, snake. okay. So, it was originally known for its sting, right? Mm -hmm. The tail, like, in this case, the, the horn is existing at the, the forehead, right? Yeah. Which is, you know, not a particularly common thing in snakes. And by that, I mean there's no snakes that use a horn to sting. Um, yeah. And it had not yet acquired its peculiar mode of locomotion okay when you said horn snake i was thinking about the snakes that have like just over their eyes like the weird little pointy scales. yeah yeah i yeah, know you're talking, talking like the unicorn snake no this is like a unicorn shit in okay. this incarnation yeah. so um basically the the thought is this is the first like literary occurrence of the horn snake yeah right then in 19 in 17 eh, 1722 Mm -hmm. The horn has migrated to the tail of the horn snake. And okay. there's an account by an individual named Robert Beverly that says, They like have likewise the horn snake, so called for a sharp horn it carries in its tail, which it assaults anything that offends it, with a force that is said with its strike tail. Uh, let me reread that, because this is, <laughs> once again, the 1700s, Eng like, like this time period of English is like, just close enough that I recognize what it's saying, but it's hard to parse and hard to speak. Yeah. They have likewise the horn snake, so called from a sharp horn it carries in its tail, with which it assaults anything that offends it. 
with the force that, as it is said, it will strike its tail into the butt end of a musket from whence it is not able to disengage itself. So, horn snake once again, and now the 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 horn mechanism exists in the tail, which if yeah. you remember the fearsome critter story was where the snakes, you know, put their the, mouth. The, they use their they use their tail to stick. Yeah. So we can see that there's an evolution of this myth. Yeah. Now, rather than being in the head, it's moved to the tail. And now you got to remember, America's a young country at this. Well, not it's not America yet. It's a young region at this point. Yes. To Europeans. So this is not like a crazy thing because there's already been animals that are just like what? Yeah. Right. So we're already. It, it, this is not insane that a like a, magically there's a lizard a reptile that has the ca- characteristics of an insect yeah it's also approaching the period where the modern pizza um may be coming into effect hmm. because tomatoes um were native to north north america uh not italy so they had to be brought over yeah i'll I know that 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 does track. It's weird that pizza is so associated with, like, the modern conception of pizza is so associated with Italy. Yeah, it's just it because like they did have a form of pizza, but I don't think it had tomato paste. So. No, it's tomatoless. It's like all the yeah. old shit that you'd throw it onto a bread and, and and eat it. Yeah. yeah. Um. Anywho, so this incarnation of the horn snake would persist up until 1779. And there's a description okay, by... Okay, that's a good Al- while. Yeah. So this is kind of what the horn snake exists. The horn snake exists like this. There's no yeah. hoop snake at this point. Okay. Right? Um, Alexander Hewitt had a particular passage about the horn snake as well. Okay. The horn snake is also found here, which takes its name from a horn in its tail, with which he defends himself and strikes with great force into every aggressor. This reptile is also deemed very venomous, and the Indians... When wounded by him, usually cut out the part wounded as quickly as possible so as to prevent the infection spreading through the body. So. Okay, so this is where venom sort of comes into play for the first time. Yes. Well, they, they said that it was as poisonous as a rattlesnake in the first yeah. century. Oh, but did they? Okay. They, they, do, they do very much, like, hammer home that this is a venomous snake. Uh, you want to deal with it as quickly as possible because yeah. – like, North America is particularly bad when it comes to venomous creatures. Yeah. I mean, Australia is pretty bad, too, but North America is pretty bad. We do have a lot of very venomous and poisonous uh, species. Mm-hmm. Um, the fanged particularly, goat? Huh? The fanged goat? Yeah, that's a, that's a bad one, because yeah. that, that definitely exists. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, the accounts ultimately paint a rather interesting story about a snake um through some evolutionary mechanism it developed an attack mechanism using its tail uh and while this is frequently seen in the animal kingdom this venom delivery mechanism is unheard of in snakes right true yeah however through some prodigious googling and cursory research uh i was able to find one species of frog the greening's frog, which okay. has skull spines capable of injecting a venom through head butt. Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. So while I couldn't find any cases of snakes having a venom delivery mechanism other than through salivary glands and their their jaw. Yeah. Um, which is I think it's the way, if I remember correctly, the way uh snakes deliver venom is effectively like a hypodermic needle, which is really yeah. cool. Um But the long and short of it it's super unlikely for a snake to have uh, an alternate delivery mechanism for venom, mm. but because there's another reptile that does have a delivery mechanism similar to the horn snake, yeah, uh, of of folklore, I'm not going to completely discount it at this time. It would just be super rare mm-hmm. and super unlikely. Now, before we go into the horn snake becoming the hoop snake. Yeah. I want to take a moment to talk about snake tales. Oh, right on. Is it is it just cool stories? Cool like campfire stories that snakes tell each other? 
Yes. Dope. It's usually it's usually accompanied by castanets. <laughs> so, as we have no existing horn slash hoop snake specimens, I thought it would be important to take a look at the behaviors that other species of snake in the region exhibit vis-a-vis -vis the tips of their tails. So, when mentioning a snake's tail, it's impossible to not mention the rattlesnake. Because uh, in addition to already being called out by name no less than three times in quotes relating to the hoop snake, <laughs> uh, this grouping of snakes is endemic to much of the United States. Um, I think there's, like, if my memory is correct, around like 35 different species of rattlesnake in the United States with like, oh, 65 bunch. subspecies. Yeah. Pretty much everywhere in the continent of the United States has a version of the rattlesnake. Yeah. Um. Owing to its widespread distribution and potent venom, which, if untreated, will kill you, uh, the rattlesnake grouping of snakes, or pit vi which is a, of the type of pit viper, mm -hmm. um, account for nearly 95% of fatalities from snake bites in the United States. Ooh, shoot. Which is literally because there's so many of them. Yeah. Because, I mean, I mean, we have, uh, in our region, we have, uh, I think, timber rattlers, from memory is correct? Yep. Um... There's four species east of the Mississippi, and the remaining species are all to the west, and mm -hmm. generally in the southwest, with I think Texas and Arizona having the most species local to them. Okay. Um, so, behaviorally, the rattlesnake is known for its use of the its eponymous rattle. Um, mm -hmm. The currently accepted hypothesis is that the evolution of the rattle is that the rattle is a warning device for predatory animals that might be a threat to the rattlesnake. Mm -hmm. It produces a signal to drive them away using the rattle, that yeah. noise yeah. that the rattlesnake is known for. And actually, mm -hmm. it's really cool because like, uh, it needs two rattle segments to be able to produce that rattle. So um, child rattlesnakes and like you know neonatal rattlesnakes yeah. won't have the rattle, and they don't get it until they're, like, a year old or something like that. Oh, okay. So before that, they have, like, a button that exists that there's a yeah. place that the rattle will grow into because it's, like, a keratin-based thing. Yeah. And frequently, rattlesnake tails will fall off. Mm -hmm. Like, like their, their rattlers will break off because it's yeah. just keratin. So, yeah. you know, it's really easy for it to get damaged. And I didn't know this, but rattlesnakes travel with their rattle held up. Oh, okay, to protect it. Yep. That's actually kind of cool. That's a cool yeah. snake fact for you. Um, yeah. Due to the deadly venom possessed by the rattlesnake and the tail behavior, mm -hmm. it is possible that some elements of the horn snake story might have originated from a maldescription of the rattlesnake. Yeah. In my eyes. Now, that being said, I did a little more research. Mm-hmm. And I found another snake that might have something to do with the horn snake. Okay. So, uh, there is a spe there exists a species of snake known as the mud snake. Uh, its natural habitat is basically the Mississippi River down mm -hmm. to the American Southeast and a little bit of the Southwest, and then it creeps okay. up the coast to uh, Virginia, roughly. Uh huh. Um. It has a very unique tail behavior, though. Okay. And it's very important. And its tail has a very unique uh, quality to it. Mm -hmm. So, the horns, the, 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 the mud snake is a yeah. non-venomous snake. Okay. And it's known as a horn snake due to a spine-like scale at the tip of its tail. Oh, okay. So, when captured, the mud snake will not bite but rather press their pointed tail tip harmlessly into their captor. <laughs> Some accounts do indicate that it will prod and poke prey with its... Uh, they poop its, you. Yeah, its pointed tail. Um, I didn't find out about this until after I'd written a bit about the rattlesnake. Yeah. But that's it, pretty interesting, because that fits, other than the hoop part and the poison part, the description of the horned snake. Yes. So it turns out that these are called horn snakes despite being uh, non-venomous so yeah. um to me this indicates that the fictional horn snake 
is a sort of uh, chimera that mixes yeah. the venom of the well-known and extremely dangerous rattlesnake with the behaviors of the less common and harder to find mud snake. Because mud yeah. snakes are actually fairly secretive creatures based on some of the accounts I read. Mm-hmm. Um, and they do have behavior that like results in them hiding more frequently. Yeah. Um, well, as a non-venomous creature, that makes sense that it would be, yeah. unless it's actively hunting, that it would be trying to stay out of sight. Yeah, because it, it, it mainly, its main prey is like salamanders and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, now, given the time period that a lot of these accounts happen, and the fact that the Americas are still young to Europeans, um, the natural wildlife and geography is fairly, fairly alien, right? Mm-hmm. So anytime you see anything that you don't know, it's like, hmm, I wonder what's going on with this thing. Yeah. Right? And the mud snake does have black and red coloration, which, for those of you who don't know, black and red coloration generally indicates some kind of venom. Yeah. So, generally speaking, if you see red on a snake, it's probably a safe bet to avoid it. I would say avoid it completely. Yeah. Um yeah (laughs) that's a fact yeah so uh it also tracks that there might be even if this version of this the creature is non-venomous there might be a venomous version Mm -hmm. and i say that because the united states literally has two snakes that look almost identical they're the scarlet king and the coral snake so if you've never seen that before uh there's like a a rhyme that's like red and black is safe and red touches yellow you're a dead fellow. Red touches black. You're okay, Jack. That's it. Yeah. I did not remember it. Here's something important. So I remember that because one, I hate snakes, and two, I hate things that can kill me. So I remember that very well from one from whenever I learned it. There are. I don't know. I don't believe this is in the United States, um, but outside, definitely outside of the United States, that mm. is not always true because there are there's another snake. That looks exactly like the non-venomous snake, <laughs> the Scarlet King, and yeah. uh, it is. It will get you. Yeah. <laughs> so just rule of thumb: avoid them either way. Yeah, yeah. It's it's probably fair. So yeah. in this case, I I'm almost positive that the Scarlet Snake, the Scarlet King, evolved. Yeah. Uh, with alongside the Eastern Coral Snake, because. It gains the reputation from the Easter Coral Snake, so it was yeah. advantageous to have that color scheme. Uh-huh. Um, at a glance, though, they look like they're just different individuals from the same species. Yeah. Like, if you didn't know better, you'd think that they were the same, same species of snake. Oh, yeah. However, they are literally different species, and that coloration could be literally life or death. Yes. <laughs> um, so if you're in a strange land and this is something you've encountered, it's not really that surprising to think that there might be a venomous version of the mud snake. Yeah. So I'm, I totally can see where this uh, creature could come from, right? Because, mm-hmm. like, if you think, oh, hey, I'm in a place that has a bunch of things that will kill me with just venom – yeah. Eh, not surprising. So, it's at this point that I'm going to go back to the hoop snake. Nice. So, um, the earliest permutation of the hoop snake is found in uh, uh, 1784. Okay. Um, the moniker is not coined by this individual, but he does report on this moniker. And it was yeah. in North Carolina that uh, J.F.D. Smith encountered an individual who referred to something as the hoop snake. That's you. Yeah, it's me. I, t- it's I traveled through time. You're John fucking Dunham. John fucking Dunham. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if anyone called me John fucking Dunham. I got called Johnny D a lot. Uh-huh. Was, I think that was the most common nickname for me. Mainly because it flows off the tongue very well. Yeah. It was mostly – now I'm trying to think. Who called me Johnny D? There's a few people who called me Johnny D pretty commonly. I don't know. I always called you John. So. <laughs> yeah. So I, well, I don't know. Well, people who I was I spent time with 
generally didn't call me Johnny D. Yeah. Like, if I played Halo with you more nights than not, you probably didn't call me Johnny D. Yeah. It was more people who I knew at school. Like, mm-hmm. I think it was mainly girls who called me Johnny D, if my memory is correct. Oh, I can see a- that. Yeah. Yeah. It was, I mean, I had no problems with it. It wasn't a bad nickname. There are worse nicknames than Johnny D. Oh, yes. <laughs> like, honestly, in high school, John fucking Dunham might be a worse nickname. <laughs> but regardless, um, so me Smith uh, has a story from North Carolina. Uh-huh. So very virulent is the snake's poison that it is reported if he should miss the object he's pointed at, it should strike his horn through the bark of a young sapling. If it penetrates into the sap or vital parts, the bark or rind will, within a few hours, swell, burst, and peel off, and the tree itself will perish. As the other serpents crawl upon their bellies, so can this. But he has another method of moving peculiar to his own species, which he always adopts when he is in eager pursuit of his prey. He throws himself into a circle, running rapidly around, advancing like a hoop, with its tail arising pointed forward in the circle, by which he is always in the ready position for strike. It is observed that they only make use of this method in attack, for when they fly from their enemy, they go upon their belly like other serpents. So it's it's he doesn't use it to flee, he only uses it for attack. Y- um, yeah. From the above circumstances peculiar to themselves, they have also derived the appellation of hoop snakes. So, so this when is was the... this? Seventeen eighty four. This is the first time hoop snake appears in text. Correct. So far, okay. Um, and at this point, the modern conception of the cryptid is basically foreign. Uh, yeah, I would like, also say rolling in a hoop. You're not always in the right position to attack. Yeah, I thought that was weird too because there is like, what is it? Uh. Let's let's assume a, an angle of about 90 degrees is good for attacking. There's yeah. about 270 degrees of your rotation that's not good. But then again, if you're rotating at, uh, what was it, 1095 rotations per minute, you're effectively always ready to attack. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so at this point, it's pretty much fully formed. Uh, yeah. It doesn't really change that much between... 1784 and uh, 1939, I think. Yeah, no. 1939. Yeah. It, it, it basically remains the same uh-huh. from this point on, which yeah. is kind of remarkable for uh, a story like this. I'm not going to lie. Oh, yeah. Because usually they do change a lot more, but from this point on, it, it's kind of wild how much the story doesn't change anymore, which considering the fact that in the previous hundred years, it changed a lot. Because mm-hmm. it went from having a horn on its head to being a tail stinger based snake that was super venomous. Yeah. So um, the differing features of the snake at this point are like embellishments, like the fact yeah. that it it could go sixty miles an hour, or the fact that it it you know had a venom that was point zero three parts per million effective. Yada yada yada. Blah, 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 that, blah. How many? That makes me interested in seeing how toxic other snakes' venom is. I did not look into that, but the main reason I didn't look into that is because all uh, the other numbers are made up. So why bother? Yes. So why bother? <laughs> it's so. It's so. Yeah. Um, yeah. But here's the thing. Mm-hmm. At this point, if you go off of the fearsome critters, yeah, uh, description of the hoop snake. It's a literal apex predator. <laughs> like, it would be a nightmare creature. And it, it, it the, the strength of its venom such that it can destroy a hodag, which is a very, if you are familiar with the hodag, it's like mm-hmm. a frog-faced weird dog pig monster. Yeah. Um, And it's big. So if it can kill that in an hour, then it would have no problem taking down a human. Right. No, not at all. Uh, it's Venom's terrifying and, but nonsensical. Its <laughs> locomotion it's is ridiculous. literally on the par on par with the cheetah. Yeah, and the cheetah, for those of you who don't know, is the fastest elephant. Yeah, and the best cat outside of me when I have to poo. That's true. I, I'll I'll beat anyone to a toilet. 
<laughs> because I don't know what it is. There's something in my genetics. Maybe it's because of the crimes I do with tacos, but I'm, I'm punished with a severe desire to use the bathroom when I need to yeah. use it. I would be interested in learning why... When you have your code brown, when you've got a number two, mm-hmm. the need to poo seems linear, but the closer you get to a bathroom, it becomes non-linear and significantly worse the closer you get. I think it's a psychological factor. I bet. Yeah. Because here's the thing. Uh, you're not near a bathroom, right? Mm-hmm. You're like, I don't think this is going to go bad. I mean, I need to get to a bathroom, but it's not yeah. going to go bad yet. I can just wait it out. I can just wait it out. You get close to a bathroom, it then becomes, I am not going to be the person who shits his pants outside of the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> because at that point, you get one, and then yeah. it's over. Mm-hmm. Once it happens, you're over. Yeah. Because then you're just going to shit your pants for the rest of your life. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And you want you want to you want to avoid that occurrence because that's a turning oh, point yeah. in your life. Once that happens, it's it's over. You're on a down. You're down. You're downhill. That's it. <laughs> it's downhill from there. There's no way of recovering whatsoever because at that point you've just your life your life is is forfeit. <laughs> you um, take this very seriously. I do. It's a legitimate concern of mine. <laughs> The, the 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 it's just a fact in the matter. It, it's it's yeah. stressful. I live with that fear. I carry that weight <laughs> in your pants. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm just imagining the ending uh, credits of uh, of Cowboy Bebop playing. Yeah. <laughs> I almost cracked myself right next to you once. Um, oh it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, down on uh, on the way back from from uh, Tubin Snow or whatever. Tubin. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh man, I remember that. That was a close call. It was very close. That I, was a close call. We had to stop the car, and I had to do an impromptu. Yeah. <laughs> I think we went like I think we stopped at like a greenhouse, and you pooped in like a burnt out house. I did go in in a greenhouse. We stopped the car and went in a greenhouse. With nothing but McDonald napkins. <laughs> I remember that. I remember that. That was a nightmare. <sighs> All right. Well, now that we've taken a poop break, uh-huh. I got I got a little bit more to tell you about the hoop snake. Ooh, okay. So because the hoop snakes haven't taken control of the world and given me giving given us terrible terrible poops. Yeah. Poop snakes. Um, I think it's fair to assume that they're effective. Yeah. Um, that being said, from where does this fabrication occur? Um, according to Carl Patterson Schmidt, who's the who was the assistant curator of reptiles and amphibians from the Field Museum of Natural History, and I should add the primary source for this episode because Ooh. we did a lot of good research and he had a lot of good. He was the person who who collated all those stories and okay. Many thanks to him. Um, yeah. It very. It was very good research actually. Nice. And, you know, I, I did a little bit more, but man, he laid it out in such a way that it makes total sense. Um, and I should also note that he performed this research in 1925, which I mm. think I said at the top of the episode, but I can't yeah. remember. Um, tales of the Hoop Snake were virulent in the American South, like mm. crazy popular at that time period. Yeah. Um, and if you think back to the range of rattlesnake and mud snakes, the two species are particularly present in this region. Um, additionally, the snakes do frequently coils on, coil on themselves, perhaps providing the uh, mental image to build upon. Oh, okay. Yeah. So the idea is you see a snake, it's coiled up like that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Maybe snakes coil up like that. And then you also add in to the fact that there's a sidewinder exists as a snake. True. Right? So you see a sidewinder moving. And you explain it to someone else, and then through the grapevine it becomes, oh, hey, it rolled through the desert. Yeah. So you already have a mental model to build on top of, and then you add a peculiar form of locomotion for a snake that actually exists. Suddenly, you've got a hoop snake that spins at 60 miles an hour. Yeah. So I I think 
I honestly think it was just uh, Campfire Tales that grew up into something kind of wild. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Because there's no reported deaths at the hand of a hoop snake. <laughs> they have no hands, John. That's true. It was at the tail. Um, and, like, in the modern era, they're not even talked about anymore, really. Outside no. of folklore. Like, a lot of cryptids you'll still hear stories of. Like, you'll even hear people joking about jackrabbits to this day. Jackalopes. Yes. Jackalopes. The, uh, I, I think meant. the first and last time I heard about a hoop snake, um, I don't remember if, if this was with my family or if it was for a school trip, but it was one of those um, old-timey reenactment areas where they have, like, people in costume and they're churning butter and, and they're mm-hmm. making musket balls and the such. And I yeah. think that might have been when I first heard about the uh, hoop and stick game and the hoop snake. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, I've never heard of the hoop snake outside of the context of research of cryptids. Okay. Uh, and it's weird, but I guess this must have been a more popular topic in, like, the 30s. Oh, I believe it. Um, because in a, when I was looking for data on the hoop snake, yeah, um, in the most recent thing I could find on it, there was a ten thousand dollar reward placed in trust by the Bronx Zoo naturalist Raymond Ditmars for the first person to prove evidence of the snake. This was in the thirties, sometime in the thirties. I couldn't find oh, a right definitive on. article, but because yeah. the guy died in like the forties, so I assume okay. it was probably sometime in the thirties or twenties or something. Yeah. Like that. Um, given the fact that uh, the Carl Patterson Schmidt wrote an article in 1925, I would yeah. assume it was maybe actually even earlier in the 20s, because okay. then it would make sense for him to write it because if there's a ten thousand dollar reward out. Yeah, it's it might a lot worth... of money back then. Yeah, it was a lot of money. Um, but you know, at, at the end of the day, I think it's a fascinating piece of American folklore. Yeah, I think it's a fun story. I think there's some pretty freaking hilarious images associated <laughs> with it. There's one in the copy for this week's episode that is probably my favorite image of anything. The ever. guy running down. Oh, transforming roll out right under that. The guy running yep. from a. <laughs> yeah. That's that's without a doubt my favorite image of any uh, cryptid that we've found on this podcast. So it's pretty good. It's pretty good. Um, <laughs> but more than that. Yeah, I'm amazed that I was able to talk for an hour about the hoop snake. On just the hoop snake, yeah. Yeah, so um, I'm a little terrified, to be totally honest, because <laughs> I legitimately, I was expecting to talk about the hoop snake for 10 minutes yeah. when I started doing this research. Mm-hmm. And it's phenomenal to me when you can find the resources on something like this, because you got to keep in mind, a lot of these, a lot of the sources that we quoted in this episode are like letters back to like the Royal Society of London. So we have, we have the benefit of this being a myth that was created in a culture of non of, uh, of written word. Yeah. Um, even though it was augmented through non-written word and non-verbal communication, yeah. because of its nature and because of the type of creature it was, uh, we were able to get more solid, like, breadcrumbs. Yeah, yeah. Right? Uh, unfortunately, a lot of things... <laughs> oh, no, it's happening. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot of cases where we don't get these solid breadcrumbs. Yeah. And it, it kind of sucks. Like last week's episode, there's it's such a new cryptid mm-hmm. that we don't have the breadcrumbs, right? Oh yeah. And we can't see the evolution of the, the creature. We can only speculate on the evolution of the creature. In mm-hmm. this case, we have a concrete, like, directed evolutionary track for how the creature moved. Yeah. Right? It moves from the horn moved from the head to the tail. It became more venomous as time. Then mm-hmm. its attributes changed a little. It became more aggressive. And then it became a literal demon wheel. 
I like that it was so venomous it could kill a tree. <laughs> That's impressive. That's impressive right there. Yeah. It's also it also belies a critical misunderstanding of how venom works. Yeah. And how so, trees work. And how trees work. <laughs> yeah, people and trees work different. Um yeah. I, I hate to, to break this earth shattering information upon you. <laughs> I'm a tree ant, excuse me. <laughs> But yeah, so that's really all I got on the, the poop snake, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Honestly, what I was originally planning on doing was doing poop snakes, hodags, and jackalopes. Oh, yeah. Because those are our three Patreon tiers. Yeah. Um, But I felt like I would be doing an injustice to hoop snakes if I didn't give them a full episode. Yeah, right on. Um, Also, a funny thing about this, this uh-huh. was my second choice for this week. Because oh, really? I found a book on another cryptid as I was starting to research it. <laughs> and it was 230 pages, and I found it yesterday. I'm like, yeah. I don't want to read 240 pages in a day. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be a bit much. So we did the hoop snake. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anywho. Good, good call. Uh, so I guess I guess it's time to, to launch into some plugs Woo! For, for our stuff and... What have you. Um, as always, our website is still cryptopediacast.com. I don't anticipate that changing anytime soon. Um, on Instagram, we're at cryptopediacast. Twitter, it's the same. Uh, if you want to get in touch with us, you can email us at cryptopediacast at gmail.com or us at cryptopediacast.com. Um, as always, all these links are on the website, and generally, we try to put some of them in the show notes. Mm-hmm. Um if you're interested in supporting the podcast, you can visit our Patreon, which there is a link in the show notes. Ooh. Um, if you're on, like, for example, uh, Podcast Addict, it literally has a thing that says support the show that you can click on. It's pretty cool. I found out about that recently. <laughs> um, on that Patreon, we'll post uh, the show notes, which are available at the Hodag tier, which is our second tier, which I think mm-hmm. is... What do we have that at? Two dollars a month. Two, two buckaroonies. Um, we have a hoop snake tier, which is a effectively Ooh, a thank you tier, which is yeah. a single dollar. You can donate as much as you want, but if you donate more than a dollar, I recommend upgrading to either the hodag or the jackalope tier, mm-hmm. um, just because then you actually get the content. Yeah. Um, there's additionally the uh, jackalope tier, which gives you access to premium podcasts, um, the show notes, and eventually. Uh, maybe a video or two, depending on when we decide to release those. Ooh. Um, I know you did at least one, Brandon. Yeah, I, I did a couple. Have done two. Yeah, the um, um, I did a couple on on our uh, on, well, not our on my first two. Yeah, um, yeah, That's so sort of like uh, we short, have short versions. Yeah, we we have some spec videos that we're planning on doing. Um, Brandon has two. I'll say there there are pilots, so to speak. Yep. Because we're we're trying to figure out a format that works for them. Mm-hmm. Um, I like them so far, but we're we're gonna work. I, I got I got to do my my takes on it too. So, mm-hmm. and then we'll release them as pilots, and then you guys can give us feedback and all that good stuff. Yeah. Um. We also have a Facebook group. Oh yeah. Uh, we do post a lot of stuff in there. And we try to interact with anyone who posts anything or says anything in there. Um, if you're interested, you can join, and we will accept you. As, as long, long as, as you're not you're a robot. Not a, yep. As long as you're not a Russian porn bot, a shoe bot. Um, <laughs> I, I don't want to say that I'm banning all robots, because if you're a sentient robot, I want you. Yep. And I it is you. a closed group, so... Uh... Post all the Mo- weird shit you want. Yeah, so your friends and coworkers won't see all the weird shit. <laughs> yep. That's a part of the reason why we made it a closed group. Yeah. Uh, if you like the podcast, okay, you guys are coming back. Uh, rate, review, subscribe, all that good stuff. It it makes us look more legitimate. Mm-hmm. Even though we released this is what episode. 24? 24? Yeah. Uh, even though this is nearly 
a quarter of a hundred episodes. Oh damn. Um about half a year. Jesus. Yeah. Uh having reviews makes us look more legitimate and makes people more interested in potentially clicking. Um if you have any monster requests or stories, feel free to send them. Uh it's hard finding good monsters. It's so hard. So the more requests that you guys pump in, the better it is for us. If you've got any creepypasta or cryptopasta, I will eventually read some for the Patreon <laughs> feed. And if you suggested a creepypasta or cryptopasta, uh, I will send you personally a copy of that episode. Oh, yeah. Um, what do you got to plug, Brandon? You could find me on Instagram at donkey underscore hands. My website is voyerb.com. My email is brandon at cryptopediacast.com. And my Twitter is at crypto brandon. Capital C, capital B. As always, if you want to get in contact with me, you can message me. You can see my many posts of 3D prints and dumb stuff at <laughs> Mew2057. Uh, if you want to tweet at me, you can access me on at JF Dunham on Twitter. I said that really weird. <laughs> Apparently, I'm hungry and tired, so we got that yeah. going on. Um, <laughs> my website is johndunhamgames.com. Hey, guess what? Still not working. I can Still Cryptopedia. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> um, I really need to rewrite my website. I, I got some really fun games on there. I mean, they were fun. Well, man, and that's the first fun. time I've some of them. That's the first time I got. I actually think I've ever complimented myself on my games. <laughs> uh, if you want to get in contact with me, you can also email me at john at cryptopediacast dot com. Um, yeah, and that's that's everything I've got going on. I think. Yep, our art was done by Tom Hill. You could find him on Instagram at Thomas Michael Hill. His website is greatergloryco dot com, and his email is tommikehill at gmail dot com. Yeah, support him. He's a good yeah, guy. Yeah, he does good stuff. Yeah. Um, he just did some more... Um, all, I, he does a lot of stuff for All Things All Comedy. All Things Comedy, yeah. Yeah, you can tell every time that they post something, you can tell if it was him. <laughs> yeah, he's got a very distinctive style. I like yeah. it, it, but he's got a great style. Yeah. Um, Which is part of the reason why it's our podcast art. Because yeah. we like it. <laughs> <laughs> um, as always... I'm your sleepy host, John. I'm your oh, oh, so so much energy host, Brandon. And things are going to get weird. Tonight you're going to hear the story of a long-forgotten American hero, Honey Dipper Dan. A long time ago, when our land was young, living was hard. Man had to draw his drinking water out of a well, hunt his dinner in the heart of the forest. When it came time to relieve himself, he had to do it in an outhouse. The trouble is, them outhouses would get full up and somebody had to empty him out. Well, that somebody was Honey Dipper Dan. <laughs> honey Dipper Dan was 20 feet tall, and when it came to honey dipping, he was better than them all. A giant of a man, strong and fit, and he wasn't afeard of handling well, his honey dipping ladle was the Liberty Bell, and a redwood clothespin kept out the smell. That was a mountain where Billy Goats played, and his big giant boots had to be specially made. Now other honey dippers will laid wear gloves, but not for old Dan, this is something he loved. He'd whistle as he worked, a credit to his species, ridden this country a big mounds of. Folks knew he was coming, you didn't.
didn't have to tell them the ground had shake and besides you could smell them you find him an outhouse and armed with that scoop he'd pull off the roof and start spooning out life is a dream and no one could spoil it till some city slicker went and thought up the toilet with a flush it was over dan's heart broken too what was a honey dipping giant to do he laid down his ladle and just disappeared but old legend has it i know this sounds weird but late late at night Put your ear to the can, and if you hear a whistle, it's probably... Honey, 